Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hope Church. My name's Joel. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm excited to be here with you all today. I hope you're having a good weekend. I hope it's been good. Um, not the best weather, but hopefully we've had, you know, some enjoyable moments. I, Friday night, ours kicked off with a bang. We had some friends over. We had such a sweet time. It was so life-giving. It was beautiful. They left. My new contact lenses came in, and I, I hadn't had contacts for like a year. I'm tired of wearing these glasses. So I was like, I'm going to order some contact lenses. They came in, and I was trying them on Friday night late to see if they were like, just, I don't know why I was trying them on. They're kind of, it was strange. But I was like, I'll just make sure they're right. So I put the right one in. It's all good. I go to put the left one in, and it falls into the sink, and I don't like to rinse it with tap water. So I get out what I think is contact solution. It's not contact solution. It's the hydrogen peroxide, like, intense, like, cleaner for it. So I'm, like, dousing it in that. And then what I do with the contacts is fun, is I fill it up like a little bowl. And then I put it in, because it feels good. So when I, this didn't feel good. I put it in my eye, and immediately my eye swelled shut. It, this burning sensation like I've never felt in my life. It was terrible. And I could not, my eye was watering, so I couldn't get the contact out, and it was, it was awful. So I went to bed with like my left eye swollen shut, and I woke up yesterday morning and had to go to the doctor, the eye doctor for like emergency, like them check it out. And they said, yeah, you have a chemical burn on your eye, and it looks like somebody took sandpaper and like rubbed your, your eye. So it looked like I had like the worst case of pink eye ever yesterday. But it was just a chemical burn, so it's fine. Um, but the cool thing is, is since I have double vision, it looks like the room is twice as full this morning, which is really cool. So if I do the head count this morning, Mark, Mark us down for like 385 people are here this morning. Um, yeah, so I started off at the bank. It's supposed to be good. I'm supposed to go back Tuesday to get it checked out. They said it should return to normal, um, so we're all good there. But I hope y'all's weekend has been a little bit better than that. Uh, we, I'm so excited. Today, we are finishing up our Edenic Vision series. Uh, we're stepping into this journey together as a church called Edenic. It's a renovation of faith. We're just, um, just kind of restructuring the way we view church, the way we view community, the way we love our community, the way we love one another, um, the way we, we walk toward healing. And so there's a bunch of beautiful things that are going to start to be implemented um, at Hope here throughout this, this year and in the coming years, and, and we've been talking through some of that stuff, and we've been talking about this word Edenic. What does it mean to live Edenic? And very simply put, to be Edenic, to live Edenic, is to bring, cultivate, serve, and protect both human life and creation. When we say creation, we mean the planet, our, our, our world around us. And so we've been looking at that. Last week, we looked through, we dove like headfirst into the Edenic Covenant. You remember that? We talked in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, when God tells Adam, look, you can eat of any tree in this garden, just don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and, and you're set. We can have eternity together, face-to-face -to -face fellowship, but we know man broke the covenant, right? And we looked at, why is that tree of the knowledge of good and evil even there? That seems cruel. And we looked at the fact that it had to be there, because choice is a part. It's not all of, but choice is is a part of love, especially when it comes to the commitment part. We choose to stay committed to one another because we love one another. And so since God didn't create us as automatons, and he created us as, as creatures with free will, there had to be another option. There had to be a choice that we, we are making. It's either we are committing to our relationship with God or we're not. And so we, we looked through that, and then we saw... We, we highlighted the fact specifically that humanity broke the covenant. God did not break the covenant, which is crucial to remember. God didn't break that covenant. So God's heart is still Edenic. He has this relentless, loving pursuit of us that he will stop at nothing to invite us back into the garden, back into fellowship with him. And so that's what we're trying to do in our community and we're trying to do in our world is inviting people back into that garden space. And so today, we're going to be talking about, more about, do you remember the word that we talked about last week? Chesed. Chesed. Yeah, if we want to be pretentious, we can say chesed. 
which is how you would like really say it, but we're just going to say hesed, okay? Um, but hesed, we talked about whenever we see in scripture um, steadfast love or loving kindness, it's directly translated from this word hesed. It's used over 190 times in the Pentateuch in the first five books of the Old Testament, and then it's used 250 times throughout Old Testament literature. And it's, it's this beautiful word that we really don't, like, we can't really encapsulate in the English language. We don't really have a word for it. So there's all these different words that are used for it, mercy and patience and forgiveness and kindness and steadfast love. And, and so whenever we see loving kindness and steadfast love, we see that. And we see that God has shown his said to us, and he's committed this covenant, faithful, loyal love. He's just constantly in pursuit of us. So we talked about that last week. Today we're going to be looking at what does Hesed look like between us? Building Hesed with one another. What does it look like and how do we build it? And we're going to be looking through the lens of Ruth. Now last Sunday I gave a little bit of homework, which I don't normally do, but I encouraged you guys to look at Ruth. Now I'm not going to do a show of hands, but did we look at Ruth? Uh, hopefully, okay. I, I know I've had some conversations. James went through it with his boys this week. I know a lot of y'all did, and so I hope you had a chance to do that. If not, do it this week. It's such a beautiful book. It's one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. We're going to be looking at Ruth today. We're going to start out in Ruth chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. Zach read it just a few moments ago. It'll be up on the screen behind me. But before we read that, just to give you a quick kind of recap of what's happening in Ruth. So in the story of Ruth, starts off with a woman named Naomi and her husband, Elimelech. And they live in Bethlehem of Judah. And they're, they're a Jewish family. And they have two sons, Mahlon and Chilion. And there's a uh, famine that's happening where they live in Bethlehem of Judah. So they go to a pagan territory called Moab, a place that's outside of Jewish territory called Moab. And so they go there to find food and to kind of like make their home there for a while. Well, while they're there, the dad, Elimelech, dies. Mahlon and Kilion, they each take a wife, Orpah, not Oprah, Orpah and Ruth, okay? And after 10 years, these two sons die. So it's just Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. And so there's this really heartbreaking but beautiful scene that happens because Naomi hears that God has, has been faithful to Bethlehem of Judah and that there's food there, and she's going to go back there, okay? She's going to go back with her people because she's, in her mind, she's got nothing to live for. Her husband's dead. Her two sons are dead. She's got these daughters-in-law, and she's encouraging them, just stay in Moab. Don't come with me. Stay with your people. Continue to worship your gods, right? And so that's what's happening. We get to this passage here where she's basically saying, go home. Go home. I'm going to go home. You go home. I have nothing for you. So it says, then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Dog ear that. So she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I go. Where you lodge, I lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well if even death parts me from you. So we see... I feel like there's so many childhood movies of like, I think my dog Skip was one, where there's this moment where there's like a person with a pet and they're like, go, you gotta go, I don't want to, right? And there's like this like, and the do like dog doesn't want to go, but there's like this really hard, it's like kind of what's happening here, but way more intense. This like, Naomi's like, go, I have nothing for you. And, and we see Orpa kisses Naomi and she bounces. And then Ruth, what does she do? She stays, she clings to her. She doesn't just stay, she clings to her. That word is, is crucial for us to see. 
Orpa, I, I don't want to like hate on Orpa, but she just kind of like, oh, okay, cool, kisses her, leaves. And I'm, I don't doubt that she loved Naomi. I'm sure she loved Naomi. But we see this difference in the way Ruth responds to Naomi, that she clings to her. There's a passage in James chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. You've, you've, you're probably familiar with part of it. It's, it's the passage where it says that faith without works is dead, right? But right before that, James is saying, listen, if you see somebody who doesn't have clothes and they don't have food, it doesn't do any good to just say, have a full belly and be warm. You actually need to go and help them find food and find clothing because faith without works is dead. It's just, otherwise, it's just empty words. And so we kind of see this played out in Orpah and Ruth's responses. Now, like I said, I don't want to come down on Orpah. She's, you know, she's doing what's, what's good for her survival. And she, so she kisses her leaves, but Ruth clings to her. There's a, a book that we're all going to have the opportunity to go through together as a family in the coming months. It's called The Other Half of Church. And I'm going to have a little quote that we're, we'll talk about in just a moment. But the authors are Jim Wilder and Michael Hendricks. And they talk about Hesed in this book a ton. And what they refer to Hesed as is relational glue. It's the relational glue that keeps us connected to one another. And so we see that very literally in Ruth clinging to Naomi. Have you ever seen um, or read Anne of Green Gables? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. There's a scene in that movie, I love it, where Anne is, um, my mom like was an Anglophile and loved all things like Prince Edward Island too, and so I grew up on Anne of Green Gables. It's weird, don't ask. But I loved Anne of Green Gables as I was growing up, and there was like, it's the time of like a one-room schoolhouse, and Anne is kind of getting into trouble, and there's this scene where she gets in trouble, and the teacher is telling her to leave the classroom. And what she does, do you remember if you've seen it, what she does on the chair? She like wraps her feet around the legs of the chair, she wraps her feet around it, her ankles, and she grabs on to the seat and she will not budge, and the teacher is trying to pull her out of the seat, and she's like, it's not happening. She is glued to this chair. She won't leave. And that's what I see. I get this, like, image of that, her, like, hanging on to this chair. I get that image when I see this, like, Ruth clinging to Naomi. It's kind of comical, but I see Ruth as, like, her legs and arms wrapped around Naomi, like, I'm not going anywhere. You're stuck with me. I love you and I'm committed to you. I'm not, I'm not, no matter what you stop telling me to go because I'm not going. It's this really, really beautiful scene. And as the story continues, Naomi's like, okay, weirdo. So we're going back to Bethlehem of Judah together and I guess you're with me now. And so they like this beautiful relationship just blossoms and Ruth goes and she begins working in the field, harvesting and gleaning barley, and this wealthy man named Boaz in his field, and, and he, she kind of catches his eye, and um, long story short, he ends up marrying her, marrying Ruth, and they have a son together named Obed, and they redeem, he redeems Ruth and Naomi. It's this beautiful, beautiful story of, of Boaz welcoming in this foreigner into his kingdom. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. And so Boaz welcomes her in, and there's this beautiful story of redemption that happens. And we get to this passage at the end. These women are, are surrounding Naomi, and there's this idea in, in Israel at the time called kinsman redeemer. And a kinsman redeemer is somebody who was kind of in, in a tribe or a clan who could redeem a widow or somebody, a relative who had lost something. And so a lot of times when a woman became a widow, the land that her husband had and that she had as a family, she lost it when the, when the husband died. But a kinsman redeemer could come, marry her, or a number of different things, and restore that land to her and redeem her. And so that's what we see happen in this story. So these women come around Naomi and they say this. It's, this is after Ruth and Boaz get married and they have Obed and then they're just rejoicing and they say, 
Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. We hear that and we're like, oh, yeah. No, to say someone is wor- that, that a woman is worth more than seven sons in this time period is unbelievably radical. Now, Israel certainly had the best, like, women's rights of any other society at the time, but it still wasn't great, wasn't good, still was not equal, wasn't good. And so for them to make this claim that Ruth, because of her said, because of her commitment to Naomi, she's more valuable than seven sons, that's huge for them to make that claim. And so what we see here is we see this is what said looks like between people. It's this faithful and loyal commitment between one another. Naomi had nothing to offer Ruth, nothing at all, yet Ruth committed to her. She refused to take no for an answer. She says, where you go, I go. Your people are going to be my people. Your God's my God, like you're stuck with me. But we see at the same time, if you look in that story, and we'll see a, a, a passage in a moment that kind of highlights this. Ruth commits to Naomi with his said, but Naomi also commits back and begins to share this wisdom with her and this knowledge with her and teaching her kind of how to go about her day. And through that wisdom is now as the redemption happens. And so Ruth receives something, Naomi receives something, but here's the thing with his said. Hesed happens regardless of being reciprocated. Like, my, D, my, my heart for loving you and caring for you is not based on what you can do for me, right? It's not a quid pro quo. The same for you and my family. The way you love me and the way you love Tracy and my family, you're, you're not doing it to get something in return. But because we're both committed to this Hesed, our needs are being met. And we talked about this a few weeks ago and sacrificing for one another. And and when I'm caring for you and I'm just doing it for the sake of caring for you because that's what the gospel tells me to do, and then you're committed back, our needs are being met continually. There is this reciprocity that happens, but that's not the basis for why we find his said important. You follow me? There's a part in John where it's in chapters 13 and 14, and it's when Jesus is is letting his disciples know, hey, I got to go now, right? There's some things I need to do. And it's one of the saddest moments in all of scripture to me. And it's kind of like, in hindsight, it's it's easier to to palate because we know what happens um, and that the Holy Spirit comes, but it's so hard if you can put yourself in the minds of the disciples because it's this moment where Jesus is telling his disciples, I have to go now. And mind you, they've been together for like three years now. Every day, every night, doing life together. And the disciples are asking these questions. And they're like, where, what do you mean, what do you mean you're going? Where are you, where are you going? How are we going to know how to, where to find you if you go? What, what is this? Like, it's this just gut-wrenching moment in Scripture where you're just heartbroken for the disciples because they just don't understand. And it's this beautiful picture of what happens with his said when you have to begin imagining what life is like apart from one another. They can't even fathom it. The disciples cannot even fathom what life looks like apart from Jesus because of the has said that they've built with one another. There's this attachment that's there that they can't even picture life without. So what does has said look like for us as a body and how do we build it well the encouraging thing is it's already happening as i look out at the people here and people who aren't here uh, it's happening already you all are already involved in building this you may just not recognize it as such but it's really valuable for us to be able to have a word for what's happening and it's very much so what's happening it's what zach talked about in the welcome of when lila beth came up 
met them, remembered a month later what their names were, and there's a very close relationship that's there now. And there's relationships happening all over the body that are just going deeper and deeper. I'm hearing about it every day. Ways that God's moving within our body, it's incredible. So his set is already happening. So be encouraged by that. Let's just put some language around it. The quote from that book, The Other Half of Church. So what that book talks about is it talks about four nutrients for good, relational, healthy soil. Okay? And the four main ingredients are joy, said, group identity, and healthy correction. Those are the four, like, uh, nutrients that they talk about in good relational soil. And so that's what he's going to be referring to in, these, in this uh, quote that we'll read. Um, but he's talking about said in this. It says this, Of the four ingredients in healthy relational soil, said will find the most resistance. The other three can be increased by intentional teaching and practices. said is different. Because it requires, pay attention to this, said is different because it requires restructuring how we think of church and the way we relate to each other. I want to read that sentence again. said is different because it requires restructuring how we think of church and the way we relate to each other. We must practice being a family. We must practice being a family, it doesn't happen automatically. said must become a part of our DNA. It's a really heavy quote. There's a lot of skin in the game when we talk about said. And I think it's no secret, especially in the Western church, that like this isn't there in large parts of the church that we see. That there really is this necessary, this, this necessary step we need to take in restructuring how we view church. In literally viewing one another as family members. As actual family and that becoming a part of our DNA. So we'll look at three ways that we build and how it looks, the way we build said with one another. And the first one is finding joy in our relationships with one another or building joy in our relationships with one another. This one seems like, yeah, okay, all right, get me like a good one that I could, probably couldn't have figured out. It, it's serious. This one is so much harder than it seems because it requires that we be intentional about actually spending time with one another. Not just crossing paths on a Sunday morning and spending time after service talk, like, that's beautiful, that's great. Don't stop doing that. But then also follow it up with, hey, what are you doing Wednesday? What are you doing? Like, we actually are being intentional, going out of our way with identifying people we we don't know yet, or people we want to go deeper with, and we're actually being intentional about spending time with one another for the sake of actually finding joy as we're together. We did this Friday night, we had some friends over from the church, and we had so much fun. Kids played video games, we ate pizza, we laughed, we talked, it was, they left, and it was just like, our hearts were so full, and then I got a chemical burn in my eye, and my heart was still full, right? So finding joy as we spend time together. There's this beautiful snapshot, and it's one of the parts in Ruth that is really easy to kind of just gloss over, but it says this. Well, before I say it, Ruth is, so she's like, she's what's called gleaning barley in the fields of Boaz. So what that means is as they're like harvesting the barley, people who gleaned came along and picked up the stuff that kind of fell off the cart and, and it, like the leftovers. And Boaz has told his people, hey, don't pick up the stuff that falls off the cart. Let Ruth come and get like whatever she wants. So Ruth has gleaned all this barley she goes and she has dinner with Boaz, and there's all these leftovers, so she's got all these doggy bags of leftovers and lasagna and, like, all this kind of good stuff that they're eating. And um, so she, that's what's happening right here when we kind of jump into this. And she, Ruth, took it up and went into the city. She took the barley up and her little doggy bags of food, okay? Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. 
she also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And said, um, and Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead, referring to her husband and two sons. It's this, it's a really easy part to kind of gloss over. But it's such a beautiful little scene in this story. And I it, picture it, like go there with me. Ruth has spent all day gleaning the barley, and she's gone to this beautiful dinner with this wealthy man, Boaz, and she's eaten all this, like, probably best food she's ever had in her life. She's taken it up in doggy bags, and she's, like, going through the city, going home to Naomi, her mother-in-law, and she, I picture her just skipping through the street, like, can't get home fast enough. Gets home, her mother-in-law, who's been waiting for her all day, greets her at the door, they come in, they lay the barley out, and the food, and, and I, don't, I don't read it as this, it, it can, we can often read scripture hearing it in such a like proper formal way, but this is really relational what's happening here, and we see this moment where Naomi's like, so where'd you glean today? Did you meet anybody? Right? That, that's what's happening here. Did, did you meet anybody? And then, she, and then Ruth's like, well, maybe. His name's Boaz, right? That's like the scene that's happening here. It's this really beautiful scene between this mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, excited for one another and excited to talk and finding joy and learning about each other's day and what happened, right? It's this beautiful scene, and we see this, we see this happen throughout the story, but this happens in our body. This happens in community groups. Last night, we had community group. It was so life-giving. We had so much fun. We we laughed together, there was incredible blueberry dessert that was brought, and guacamole, we ate good tacos, and we just laughed, and then we had an awesome discussion, and my nine-year-old Eddie watched all the kids in the bonus room, and so it was like not a, no crying kids, and we just talked, we discussed, it was beautiful. We had fun, we went deep with one another. This happens when we have our family meals on the fifth, the months that have five Sundays, we do a family meal after service, this happens, we're connected, we're bonding over a meal, Growing closer with one another, we're finding joy and just sharing good things together. It's going to be happening in our classes that are, that are going to start rolling out, trauma healing, theology and spiritual formation, and just hanging out, just hanging out together. I, there's a group that started Sunday nights. John performs at, he plays guitar at Urban, wait, what? Urban Cowboy? Urban Cowboy? Yeah. And there's like a group that started going on Sunday nights to like watch him jam and, and they just go and like get drinks and, and hang out and talk. And it's the best. I love it. I haven't been, but I, it's the best. I want to go. I haven't gotten invited yet, but it's fine. <laughs> um, just that, just being intentional about spending time with one another, getting outside of ourselves. So finding joy in relationships with one another. The second thing, how we build his said with one another, what's it look like? Faithful commitment. Now, this is really where rubber meets the road. Because in faithful commitment, there's this mutual vulnerability that happens, or that should happen. That as we find joy in our relationships with one another, as we begin to trust one another, there's this vulnerability that we're invited into. We talk about it a lot. The goal is to be fully known and to fully know. And so there's this transparency that, that should happen. This vulnerability that's there that we handle with care, the utmost care and respect. When somebody's vulnerable with us, man, we like, we handle it like it's the most fragile thing in the world. We care for it. And we don't just listen, we, we, we check in, we encourage, we hold accountable when we need to. We love, we walk together through this stuff. There's this mutual vulnerability that's there. A part of this is also healthy conflict. Conflict is gonna happen. Conflict has already happened. That it, it, whenever people are together, conflict is present. It happens. But it doesn't have to be something that tears us apart. It doesn't have to be destructive, and it doesn't have to be unhealthy. There's very healthy ways of approaching conflict that is inevitably going to happen. And so said means, look, 
I'm committed to this. Even when things get hard, like, okay, cool. Uh, there's no other option. For, I'm not leaving. I'm committed to this. I'm committed to you. There's this healthy conflict. And out of that, we see just grace upon grace upon grace and remembering what Christ has done for us and the grace that we, that we lavish upon others and that we give each other the benefit of the doubt. And there are, we're always seeking first to understand and then to be understood. Right? There's this forgiveness and reconciliation that becomes, that's always in our, in our sights when we approach conflict. Yes, this hurts. I'm hurting. You're hurting. Okay, let's lament. Let's grieve. Let's do that well. But we have forgiveness and reconciliation in our sights. And so we see this faithful commitment to one another is the second thing so we have finding joy in our relationships with one another we have faithful commitment and then the third thing is championing one another now there's obviously i could this is not an exhaustive list list of how we build his said and as we journey together we'll learn more ways but the third way is championing one another here's the thing we're talking about living edenic how do we live edenic bringing life cultivating it serving, protecting, building God's kingdom in the world. We all have different ways of living Edenic. We don't want to try to force people into certain things. We want to respect the fact that God has gifted us all differently. We have different passions. We have different experiences. And so we all live Edenic in a different way. And so we want to, we want to not just acknowledge that, but we want to actually champion one another in that and encourage one another and come alongside each other. And especially us as like a church, how do we come alongside you and up under you and actually support you and build you up and prop you up in that? How can we further equip you? How can we as a church support you in that? How can we come alongside of you, champion you in that? We have so many people who live Edenic in so many different ways through gardening and through music instruction and working in the public school system and, and it, so many different things, design, graphic design, interior design, whatever. How can we as a church come alongside one another and support each other in those endeavors? So we have finding joy, faithful commitment, championing one another. And as we close out, I just want to note, we cannot build said with one another if we are not building said with God in our relationship with him. If we're not finding it in, in our relationship with him, it's, it's just lip service with one another. It's a futile effort. And so when we look at what it looks like to build his said in our relationship with God, it's really the first two are the same. It's finding joy in our relationship with him. It's actually taking time to be with him, to talk to him. And, and it, this can so many times when you say like, be with God, talk with, it can sound so like cliche and like Sunday school-y, but, but I mean it. Actually spending time in his presence, communing with him. And whatever part of his creation you find most beautiful and that excites you and inspires you the most, for some of you it's out in the woods, for some of you it's designing something on a computer, whatever it is, enjoying that with intentionality of communing with God and finding joy in his creation and in your relationship with him. And two, it's a faithful commitment to him. It's not settling for where we currently are. We're constantly seeking to go deeper and deeper in our transformation into Christ-likeness. We're not saying like, cool, I've arrived. I'm here, I made it, right? We know that like in recovery, you never like, fully recover you do but you're like recovery is a lifelong journey right you commit to it it's the same thing that we're constantly committed to this transformation and then third building has said with god is that we're seeking edenic transformation meaning that we are allowing his spirit to work through us in an edenic way here's the thing Micah, you guys can come up if you want. We all have gifts and talents. I want to make sure all of you hear that. You, every single one of you, is gifted in something. You have a talent. God's created you when he was molding you in the womb. 
there was a gift, at least one, that he was implanting in you to use to build his kingdom. Every single one of you is gifted in something. If you've never heard that, I'm sorry, but today is the first time hearing that. You're gifted, okay? We all have them. Gifts, talents. And Liz brought up in our sermon walk through something that I think is, is really crucial and beautiful to, to understand. That we are all, we all connect with God differently. There are certain things that we're all called, we're, we're all, if, as apprentices of Jesus, we need to be spending time in prayer and scripture study and fasting. And there's moments that like we all corporately are called to. But the way that looks for each of us is different. My prayer time, like, I can't do the, like, quiet, in a dark room praying thing. My mind's just like, ew, 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 all, all these other things, crazy stuff. But when I drive, and I'm, I'm just driving, and I just pretend like he's just sitting in the seat next to me, like, physically, yeah, I can just pray, like, ad nauseum. That's the way it works for me. And so understanding that we all, we all connect with God differently. But here's the thing. As we're connecting with God and as we're exploring our gifts and our talents and those things, are we allowing the Holy Spirit to really utilize those things in an Edenic way? A lot of us utilize them for, like, work, which is good. Work is good. But are we, are we actually allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us in a way that we're actually, like, building his kingdom in our personal lives, in our own spheres, at home and at work and with our friend groups and, and at the gym and wherever? Like, are we actually using the gifts that he's given us to build his kingdom and finding joy in it and cultivating that? Remember, we talked last week about his said not just being steadfast love or loving kindness, but that there's this imaginative, courageous part of his said, that it requires courage and imagination for us to think outside of the box of how we build his said with one another. And as we look through this lens as a church, how do we connect and build his said with our community that we're in? How do we think outside of the box? How do we live courageously in building his said? And as we close, I just want to introduce you to kind of two really things that are going to be happening. One of the things we've talked about trauma healing that's happening in classes. We're going to be doing church, some church partnerships. But two really awesome things is something called the Creative Collective. And we're going to be opening up our space, our facility, regularly to creatives in the community to be able to come in and utilize the space to do kind of like a writer's round on steroids where there's people who do all kinds of different creative endeavors, stuff that you would naturally think of, painting, music, dance, whatever, and then whatever else. We're opening up our building and inviting the community in to use the space to collaborate, to network, to create, and us to actually like lift that up, provide food, be here for encouragement, support, relationship building, doing that. And then another thing, and this is like super exciting, is we are gonna begin in the fall, the first phase, and then next spring, turning our front yard into a garden. So the front yard of hope will begin transforming into a garden. That's not just a garden for the sake of having a garden, but it's actually a garden that's like certified smart yard through University of Tennessee, harvesting rainwater, like leading the charge in what it looks like to actually sustainably and healthily care for our planet as we do this and inviting our community to come and be a part of that and partnering with local schools and universities to come and be a part of this, not just like being a part of the conversation like we've been talking about, but actually leading the charge. And what does it look like to actually care for our planet? We're going to be doing that. And so we invite you guys in these endeavors. We want you to be a part of this. And we also invite you, if neither of these things are like, eh, eh, whatever you are gifted or talented in, let us know. We want to support you. We want to come alongside of you and help you because we understand and recognize that everybody's going to be living identically in different ways. And it's beautiful and it's necessary. But I just want you today, I think as we do this last song, just spend some time praying through 
How has God gifted you? And are you using it to live Edenic, to build his kingdom? Let's pray.